Welcome to Podcapers, the official podcast for a place to hang your cape. And this week, let's see how far we can plumb the depths of my own ego. We're completely rewriting a brand new Star Wars movie. Cue the music! Hello there, capers, and as I said, welcome to Pod Capers, the official podcast for a place to hang your cape. My name's Scott James Merridge, and this is the show where we talk about various geek and nerd related topics, and I'm joined each week by a very special different guest. It's Gillian de Blasio. Hello, hello. Hi, Gillian. I was about to say, how are you? But then I remembered <laughs> you're American, and that would be a bad question to ask nowadays. Yes, it would. You're yeah, like keep on doing that we're gonna help you forget about all the crap that's going on with your once mighty republic and we're going to talk about something that isn't crumbling from the foundation with a few brief sparks of hope erupting from it the star wars franchise oh wait what <laughs> it's just because i mean star wars is being carried right now by the mandalorian yeah and honestly, like, I mean, I, I don't know if you want to go into this discussion, but I'm getting, I'm starting to get a little bored with the Mandalorian. So it's like, <gasps> yeah, I mean, unpopular okay, so, opinion. No, I mean, I get why, because here's the thing. Mandalorian when it is not this huge, you know, really deep and complex. Well, I mean, it is complex, but in a subtle way. It's, there's not a ton of stuff happening. It's a relatively simple story, and that's good. That works for The Mandalorian, but for people who are maybe coming off something like Game of Thrones and whatnot, it may feel a little underwhelming. I would argue that it's not. Like, I... I don't care if a story is simple or complex as long as it's good. You can have good, complex stories and good, simple stories. And The Mandalorian is a very good, simple story. There's depth to it with characters and motivations and theme. And, you know, there's just stuff happens in it. I mean, if you watch the last episode, which we're not going to spoil here, holy crap, a bunch of cool stuff happens. Yes. Uh, oh, actually, actually, I say that. There will be some spoilers for The Mandalorian uh, seasons one or two at later points in the show capers. So if you're not entirely caught up yet, I recommend watching that and then coming back to this. But we're going to talk about that later. But I just I just want to say that. So I've seen a lot of videos on YouTube lately of thumbnails with Ryan Johnson on them with the title Ryan Johnson still clearly doesn't get Star Wars. And that got me thinking because that's a misleading statement. Yes, Ryan Johnson clearly didn't really understand Star Wars, but that didn't mean he was a bad director. He's a very good director. Did you see Knives Out? Yeah, it was great. I loved Knives Out. I watched it like two or three times when it came yeah, on it, Amazon Prime. It's the kind of movie where you can watch it two or three times. It's that good. And so, which begs the question, why did Disney, and let's be honest, it's Disney, why did they hire him to do that movie? It's very much outside of his wheelhouse. Especially when you have people like John Favreau and Dave Filoni, who clearly do understand Star Wars and are also very good directors, and who really can craft a really good story. Now, I'm not saying that these guys should automatically, let's give them all Star Wars stories from the get-go, that all that they should have directed Rogue One. I'm not saying that. I just... It's interesting because I think what, um, what Disney tried to do is the same thing they do with Marvel. I think they just tried to get good, solid directors who have done good stuff in the past and just attach them to a Marvel project and say, okay, here's what we're going to give you control over and here's what we're going to retain control over and we're just going to go from there. Here's the thing. I think, personally, and this may, again, this may be an unpopular opinion, I think that works for Marvel movies because it's not just one single story when they do a movie. It's a small part of a much deeper interconnected tapestry of narrative. However, Star Wars is different. With the exception of the Skywalker saga, most stories, whether they be in movie, TV, uh, comic book, or video game form, are kind of separate 
to the rest of the saga, the rest of the galaxy. There may be a few callbacks, a few shared characters here and there, but most of the time they're just self-contained stories. And really, you need to give your directors a little bit of freedom on that. And I think the best example of where that could have gone right was actually with Gareth Edwards in Rogue One. I think Gareth Edwards is a particularly good director. I'm not familiar with his other work, like, say, Ryan Johnson. But it had great cinematography, great action scenes, and one or two fun characters. But you could feel Disney's greasy paw prints all over that movie, just reining it in, reining it in. And you just can't really do that with Star Wars. And, and so... And it's things like, okay, so let's add all these elements here. Because we've all seen that picture of like a Disney development executives meeting with a huge whiteboard full of stuff they want to have in them, them Star Wars movies, including, but not limited to, dinosaurs and diversity. <laughs> and, uh, okay, so two, two mini rants connected to that. First of all, diversity is good. We need diversity in films. That, however, cannot be part of your cold corporate marketing tool set. It just can't because it will feel shallow and hollow and cheap. And the second people start complaining, which they will because there are bastards out there, you're going to get scared and drop them, which is exactly what happened to John Boyega and why he's so justifiably pissed. Go, John Boyega! Go and rant about how they completely screwed you over because you are entirely justified in doing so. I believe in you! Yeah, uh, yeah, that was that was a little ridiculous. I was gonna say it's sounding a lot like Mulan too, but you know. Oh, don't even get me fucking started on that. My hatred of that live action movie has only intensified since I last saw it and did a review on it. But second mini rant. Okay, yes, yeah, dinosaurs are cool. Dinosaurs are cool. I think we, as human beings, as a species, can all link hands in one great glorious moment of unity and say dinosaurs are cool. No one would disagree with that fact. But just because something's cool doesn't mean it fits. And so pair a dual pair of characters, say like, I don't know, a blind monk that uses the force and an ex-shock trooper tank person who has a big heavy repeating gun, putting that in something like, oh, I don't know, Rogue One doesn't really fit and i brought this up when we re-scripted rogue one i said of bays malbus and chirrut imwe stupid names stupid stupid names i said these characters are too cool to be in this movie and i made the bold decision to just completely snip 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 cut them out of the movie and put them in their own story and that capers is what we're going to do today remember if you listen to that episode if you remember me saying that well that's the story i'm talking about that's what we're going to talk about today but before we do that we need to talk about the news because there's been a couple of stuff happening um recent days that i want to talk about first of all get it out of the way cyberpunk 2077 after i think like seven years of waiting when it was first announced it's right around the corner it's it, it's almost here people and i can't wait yeah i just really want it to uh be better than the last of us part two because I don't oh, want that. Hurdle. I do not want that game to win best game of the year. Like I really, if if it wins, I'm gonna be so mad. So this is my like last hope. <laughs> that game is our last hope. Yeah, no, there is another. I can't do Yoda. I, I've tried for years. I just can't do Yoda. I can Palpatine. Yes, Yoda. No, I don't know why I'm cursed. I just wanted to point out because I similarly am looking forward to Cyberpunk 2077. I think it's cool. And I'm not a fan of first person games, but I'm really going to be looking forward to playing Cyberpunk 2077. Oh, just let me be clear. I have no intention of playing this game. I just want it to be a good game. Oh, okay. So you want it to succeed not because you're enjoying it, but just out of spite. Yes, exactly. 
There are worse motivations. People say, oh, no, you shouldn't act out of spite. You know what? A lot of human ingenuity has been, you know, motivated by spite. Edmund Hillary climbed Mount Everest because someone said he couldn't. So that's fine. I, enc I encourage you to do that. Yeah. Yeah. And so, uh, next bit of news, uh, Warner Brothers have announced that they're going to stream all of their 2021 20, uh, movies on HBO Max, which is a kind of a huge upset, because especially for theatres, we're hoping that COVID will have completely gone well into uh, 2021, but no, they're going to go all streaming, and uh, that's a great fat big news for... Uh, Warner Brothers DC fans who are looking forward to seeing Wonder Woman, and there's other people in the corners like, um, Disney, are we gonna get to see Black Widow on Disney Plus? And all they got back was silence. Yeah, I mean, I don't know what Disney, uh, this is a terrible decision on Disney's part, I feel like, because first of all, Black Widow should have been made like years ago. So it's like, yeah. you asking us to wait until May now? Like a whole Should have been made after Iron Man 2. Yeah, exactly. It's like, it's just like, whatever. Yeah, I mean, it's it's conflicting for me. Because on the one hand, I am a Marvel fan and I want to get my Marvel movies quick as poss. But on the other hand, I loathe Disney in all its myriad forms. And so them making stupid decisions is something I can laugh over. So it's like, you know, cutting off my own nose to spite my face. It's, uh, it's a weird sensation for me. And so those are some of the biggest news. But... Honestly, the one thing I want to talk about the most, which actually got announced right after we did the uh, last episode, uh, otherwise I would have um, I would have talked about it then. Elliot Page, and he's come out as transgender. Yeah, good for him. Damn right, good for him. Uh, this is a uh, obviously this is a huge land landmark for you know trans visibility and all that, but it's also it's it's great for him that he's come to this realization about himself, and this is something that he's happy with and accepted as part of himself and uh just on behalf of all of us at pod capers good for you that's really awesome and best luck on this next part of your journey this is really awesome and <laughs> this is it's, it just it just makes me happy honestly it is this we we need i say we need something like this this isn't about us it's about elliot page but this is still good because now because Visibility like this is really great, especially for trans people, especially for trans children, when they look on the screen and see someone like Elliot Page, and it means they can be more open and accepting about themselves. Yeah, and you know, I think it's a good counterbalance to uh, J.K. Rowling's uh, bullshit. Yeah. So <laughs> <laughs> That's what we were talking about as well uh, last week. So uh, yeah, yeah, very much needed. And so congratulations to Elliot Page. Right, that's the news done. Now we can get on with the actual fucking show. So um, let's just, before we go any further, do a quick recap of Rogue One, then a quick recap of the rescript we did. And uh, actually, we might not do a recap of the rescript. But uh, okay, so Rogue One, blah, 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 blank-faced, no-acting McG, a.k.a. Jyn Erso, uh, gets kidnapped by a bunch of rebels, taking this place called Jeddah to link up with Saw Gerrera and his partisans, blah, 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 blah. Death Star, blah, 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 blah. I mean, look, These... everybody dies at the end. Everybody dies at the end, including uh, Chirrut Imwe and Baze, Blaze Malbus. I don't know, I can't fucking remember because they didn't go into any detail. They didn't go into any detail or any depth about these characters and that was what frustrated me. That movie was too clustered. People talk about this movie like, oh no, it was actually quite good. And you know what, if you like it, fine, fair it, enough. It was good because everybody dies. That's like the only thing the movie had going for it is because they had the balls to actually kill everybody off. Well, is it really ballsy though? Because think about it. They had we had just been introduced to these characters. We had no ties to them. We had no real uh, connection. They were disposable. Yeah, but I mean, you know, it's not expected. It's it's subverting expectations. Scott. I fully expected them to die, to be perfectly honest with oh, you. Oh, I didn't. I was just watching it, and I and, and as soon as the first guy went down, I was like, yeah, that's that's predictable. They're going to kill at least one of them. And then the second one went down, and I was like, wait a minute. Are they going to kill 
all of them. And then as it, as the deaths kept happening, I was just like, oh my God, they're going to do it. They're going to kill all of them. This is great. And Meanwhile, in my died. head, I was just going like, bum, 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 but um bum, 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 bum. And another one down, and another one down, another one bites the dust. And these are the, the only two characters I cared about in that entire film were Chirid Imwe, played by Donnie Yen, who I think is amazing, and K2SO, played by Alan Tudjuk, who I similarly think is amazing. Those are the only two characters I cared about, because they were the only two that were actually, you know, properly acting, and the only one with any real personality, with the possible exception of Bodhi, the guy played by Riz Ahmed, but we spent so little time with him, I didn't really care. And let's be honest, those two characters got all the best lines. And so whilst I can't, sadly, in all good conscience, resurrect K2SO, love you, my saki little boogie, I love you, I can, however, do that with Shira Inway because I cut him out of the movie along with Blaze by Tank Guy. I don't know. And so this is their story. But the, the question is, what kind of story are we going to tell? A Rogue better one, one was a better one. Yes. But <laughs> what, what what kind of story? Because here's the thing. The options for us in terms of telling different kinds of stories are almost limitless. And in fairness, Star Wars has tried to do that. Rogue One was meant to be sort of an intrigue, um, desperate, slightly more bleaker look on the Star Wars universe. I don't think it entirely succeeded, but I appreciate it trying. And it did occasionally get that sort of right sort of tone. Han, the Han Solo spinoff movie was meant to be like an action-packed caper heist movie uh, basically devolved that's into a movie that's what that where... was supposed to be well that's what it was supposed to be but it turned into just a movie where han solo gets his stuff yeah i did so... not think i did not see it as a heist movie at all yeah yeah because if lord of miller had been allowed to direct that's probably would have would turn into but they didn't allow them any sort of creative freedom so what kind of story are we going to tell here yes a better one but I want this to be a more reflective, introspective, and emotional one based on, I guess, Jedi philosophies, but also perhaps a little search for enlightenment. It's So if The Mandalorian is a space western, I kind of like this movie to be sort of like a space wuxia story, because I really like all those classic uh, Chinese martial arts movies. So that's kind of what this is going to be. Bear in mind, like I'm not like a Chinese... A cinema scholar, uh, my you know, my training and you know my academia, if you want to call it that, is thoroughly rooted in you know Western movies. But you know what, George Lucas was inspired by the works of Akira Kurosawa, and so why can't this movie be inspired by the films of things like uh, Bruce Lee? So that's kind of what I'm going for here. But again, we're still going to focus a lot more on emotion and things like that that's my manifesto going on going forward whether or not you think i actually achieved that that's up to you jillian okay i mean i'm not really familiar i haven't seen a lot of the movies that you're describing so i'll just tell you if i think it's good or not i'll write you a list afterwards uh i, I still haven't seen drunken master 2 god i know shameful but anyway, uh, so that's one thing. Also, one other thing, before we go any further, I want to talk about the character of uh, Baze Malbus. Because I liked Chirrut Inway, and I liked Donnie Yen's portrayal of Chirrut Inway. Baze Malbus, I wasn't that into, partially because it wasn't given a lot of you know time to develop, and his relationship with Chirrut seemed kind of like threadbare. And um, I didn't particularly enjoy the performance of the actor playing him, which I believe is called uh, Jiang Wen. Uh, I, I, just, I just didn't really get into him. And so, I could have. You know what, I could have rewritten the character. I could have given this actor a lot more to do, but I went in a slightly different direction. So I have changed the character Baze Malbus almost from the ground up. The personality, like the gruff, cynical sort of personality, that's there, still there. But the character itself is different. For starters... He could no longer be played by Jiang Wen, because now Baze Malbus is a clone. <gasps> dun, dun, dun. And therefore can only be played by Tamora Morrison. Here's where the spoilers for The Mandalorian come in. Are you caught up with The Mandalorian, Jillian? 
Yeah, I watched the last episode on Friday. Good. Okay, so you're aware of the fact that now Tamura Morrison is back as Boba Fett. Yes, I am. It's the one thing my boyfriend was excited about with this show. Okay. <laughs> uh, and it's very, very cool that he's back in, but it's clearly... I mean, here's the thing. Uh, with one or two exceptions, um, the characters of the clones have mostly been portrayed via voice acting through D. Bradley Baker, who's done a fantastic job. Check him out in Star Wars Clone Wars and you know Star Wars Rebels and stuff like that. He's amazing. He's great. He's awesome. But the fact that Tamura Morrison is in The Mandalorian leads me to think that he might, just might, I don't know for certain, be interested in being in more Star Wars projects. So let's say this film gets released maybe shortly after the Han Solo movie. I know it's called Solo, but I just... It's Han Solo movie, let's be honest. Let's say it gets released shortly after that. Uh, you know, still with Donnie Yen, but now we've got Tamura Morrison in the role previously occupied by Jiang Wen. Just remember that going forth. So and obviously it won't be called uh, Baze Malbus, but uh, we're be giving him a different name, which I'm going to describe uh, shortly. But just have him in your mind. Also, please be aware that this story takes place a few years before the Battle of Yavin, and therefore a few years before Rogue One. So that's all we really need to know going forward, because this is not going to be a story with a ton of callbacks to previous movies. Like, you can imagine there'll be, like, pre similar, you know, species and droids and, you know, ships and stuff in the background. But in terms of the foreground, it's mainly going to be new stuff. Stuff that fits into Star Wars, but there's not going to be a lot of, for want of a better word, overt fan service. Right. I just, I just think, I just think this, we need something a little bit new, just a little bit new, rather than like, ooh, remember that? Ooh, remember that? Ooh, remember that? Ooh, remember that? And because like one or two of those stuff is fine, that's fun, but otherwise it gets a little bit overwhelming and just distracting. So, takes place a few years before the Battle of Lavin, except we start <gasps> to crawl or not to crawl. I don't know. Okay, so what's your take? Jillian, I apologize if I've asked you this before. What's your take on the no crawl thing in the spinoffs? I don't care. I'm not Fair enough. <laughs> I'm not a big enough Star Wars fan to like care about that kind of stuff. Just give me a good story or movie like set in that universe. I don't give a shit if you do the crawl or not. <laughs> fair enough, fair <laughs> enough. Um, okay, so we'll we'll say no crawl then, and we start. We're a flashback about ooh, seven or so years before the very start of the Clone Wars. At the Jedi Temple on Coruscant, we see a young Padawan. Who is it? Why, it's young, early teens, Chiritimwe. Dun, dun, dun. You mean and it's he's... not Baby Yoda? No, it's not Baby Yoda. <laughs> no, not everything is Baby Yoda, Jillian. <laughs> I mean, he should be there. <laughs> I'm just saying. It's a big temple. There's lots of people there, you know? Okay. So, Jared Emma is there. He's a teenager. And he's in the middle of a training duel with another Padawan, uh, Adra Yadan. Now, it should be noticed, actually, while they are, you know, Padawans, they're like pre-Padawans. Like, they're about to be selected to be Padawans for a singular master. And there's a couple of masters surrounding them, just sort of observing them. But you could say they're Padawans in training at this point, even though a Padawan is a Jedi in training. Uh, so they're having a little duel, and Adra is somewhat lighthearted. She's like, hey, this is kind of fun. I'm really enjoying this. But Shurit is very serious. He's focused. He's determined. He's very, very serious. And while they're doing, um, you know, the masters around them, surrounding them, it's just like, feel the force flowing through you, all that crap. And while they're doing, Ador Adra just, I nearly called her Adora for a second there. Like, no, I know, I know, I want this to be she and the Princesses of Power, but that show is over. I have to move on. Adra taunts him a little, like, oh, come on, Shurit, you can do better than that. Shurit does not respond well. He gets a little bit angry. A little bit frustrated. Then he starts lashing out. Then one of the masters, 
the one the Jedi Masters, Kratos Null, there will be a lot of stupid names in this. It's Star Wars. I can't stop that. You can't stop that. Nobody can stop that. Yeah. Kratos Null orders Chirrut to stop, but Chirrut completely ignores him and just wails on Adra. And then Krato, because he's a full you know, Jedi Master, easily disarms and stops Chirrut. Just like, like, force pulls the lightsaber right out of his hand and makes him completely stop. And he then was Chirrut, okay, so what you just did there was a no-no. You tapped into the dark side, and frankly, that's not good. You've been, been trained for a little while now as a youngling, but this display... I can't see anyone taking you as a powder one, because frankly, your whole future as a Jedi now is kind of under question. You need to sort your life out, kid. And Chirrut, at this point, is should take a moment to reflect and try and figure out where his anger comes from. However, what he does instead is later that night, he takes out his anger on some training probes. You know those little ball things that Luke... Uh... Yes. So he, you know gets a bunch of them to fly around him and start zapping him with lasers. And as his anger grows and grows, he tries deflecting more and more blaster bolts, increasing the danger settings on the training probes. And at one point, he just lashes out with a force, just like telekinetically lashes out at one of the probes that's just a little bit too close to him. And the probe explodes right in his face, injuring him. Jedi healers attempt to, you know, fix the damage they managed to heal his face but unfortunately they their powers only go so far and he's been rendered blind part of the reason for that is because his connection to the force has been severely damaged and because of that he can't really become a jedi anymore now the law of the jedi law of star wars has a couple of roles that happen for people who try to become Jedi or train to be Jedi, but don't quite make it for one reason or another. And that is, they don't become Jedi and they get sent off to do busy work somewhere else because they can't really reintegrate with galactic society now because that's what happens when you take people as babies and raise them in cloistered seclusion. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, uh, Kratos, the master that I m mentioned earlier, regretfully sends him to a Jedi enclave on the planet of Phalex to become a caretaker there, uh, no longer Jedi, and instead takes Adra as his apprentice instead. And, you know, as we see, blind uh, Chirrut board the transport, looking behind him but not really seeing anything, he looks more lost, alone and confused than he's ever been. Title card! Da -da 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 -da. Flash forward to the present, again a few years before the Battle of Yavin, we uh, see a ship flying through space full of mercenaries. And this is one of the problems with uh, just talking about this in audio form, is like, this is a, what I want this movie to be is kind of like a Star Wars concept designer's wet dream. We're going to have a lot of different opportunities for a lot of different people to bring their unique designs to the Star Wars world. So... This ship is full of mercenaries of different sizes, shapes, genders, and species. Some of them have cybernetic components. Maybe some of them, you know, have different kinds of weapons. It's an, it's an eclectic bunch. And one of the mercenaries is a clone trooper. No longer wearing clone armor, but still very much clearly a clone. Now, you're aware, Julian, about the fact that the clones uh, had accelerated aging. I do now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, they had, they had accelerated aging so that they, you know, wouldn't stick around for like 20 years on Camino waiting to become soldiers. No, it just like a couple of months, maybe a year or so, and boom, fully grown, ready to go in the world. The only downside for that was the aging kept on going. And we see in Star Wars Rebels that a lot of the relatively young clones that we saw in the, um, the Clone Wars have now aged to become... Uh, you know, quite old. And this it actually plays into our favour with Tamura Morrison, because uh, whilst he played the clones and Jango Fett in uh, the last two movies of the Star Wars prequel series, uh, he's, you know, it's been like 12 years since then, so he looks significantly older. So 
that age pays into a favor because then we can just say like oh it's you know it's been accelerated aging maybe we could age him up even a little bit more uh, using makeup and stuff um so that works in our favor and so Tamura Morrison in this movie is going to play clone trooper CT-7772 aka Bulwark because the clones all gave themselves nicknames because otherwise it's just like numbers and that's no fun. Right. Hmm. That I do know. So. Yeah. So uh, this clone trooper is called Bulwark. He's part of this mercenary group and they've been contracted by the Empire to raid a settlement on a planet in the Outer Rim called Tusin Jaw. This, this settlement on the planet has been paying its you know, mandated imperial taxes. But due to the fact that a recent ahem, rebellion has sprouted up all over the galaxy, they can't really justify sending a garrison of stormtroopers out there. So they loan out a bunch of mercs to do their dirty work for them. And we see inside the, uh, the merc ship that Bulwark clearly doesn't get on very well with the other, you know, scum, greedy mercs. But he does tolerate them. In fact, he seems very moody and withdrawn. This is why I'm talking about the personality of Baze Malbus being intact. Because one thing that could have really worked in Rogue One was the difference between these two main characters. You know, one's optimistic and one's cynical. It's classic, maybe even a little bit cliched, but it works. Especially when you have conflicting ideologies. Yes. So these mercenaries land on uh, Tucson Jaw and they start harassing the settlers in, you know, typical sort of fashion. Uh, and the lead of the mercs, a particularly despicable guy called uh, Hoss Zabe, or Zabe? How did I write this down? Zabe. Hoss Zabe. Because Zabe just sounds like, hey, I just met you and this is crazy, but here's my number because I'm Hoss Zabe. Like, no, no, we're not going to do that. Hoss Zabe. Uh, is taking a lot of pleasure in harassing the locals, you know, firing at the feet. It's a typical sort of Western, you know, bad guys roll into town sort of thing. Suddenly, again, in typical Western fashion, the hero walks out and confronts them. It's Chiritimwe, everybody! Yay! Whoa, I had no idea he would show up again in this movie! It's almost like he's the main character, played by fucking Hitman of all people. Anyway, uh, he walks out and he asks them politely to leave. Like, hey guys, could you could you not? Could you not, please? And the mercs all laugh. I, again, I'm playing to some cliches here, but they're, they're cliches because they work, you know? And, and they're all laughing at him because, like, who does this guy think he is? Obviously, the only one who is not laughing is Bulwark. He's just like, hate everything, hate that I'm doing this, yeah. And then they all try to intimidate him. But he just shows, like, no reaction. He's like, very calm and placid, just like, oh, come on, guys, we don't need to do this. And that kind of pisses them off, even more so when they realised, wait a minute, this guy's blind. And if he can stand up against us, ha 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 ha, let's kill him. He then proceeds to kick all of their asses. Remember that scene from Rogue One where he beat up all the stormtroopers and made jokes at their expense? Yes. That was fucking awesome. Let's do that. Good. Yeah. Now, this is where I need to bring up something that I really want your opinion on. So, some criticism has been levied towards characters in, you know, movies and comic books and such like that that have superpowers, but also disabilities that kind of nullify their disabilities uh, a good example would be daredevil the people who criticize like oh he's blind but you know his superpowers mean he's not really blind yet he still claims to be blind yeah. some people some people calling that um ableist i think is the term and i will admit there's some credulity to that argument but i'm interested to think see, see what your take on it is i mean i get what they're saying I feel like I feel like it's one of those things where we where we should start being in a transition period where we kind of start to stop doing that. Um, mm. But I think it's okay if like a movie or two still has that going on, 
in the film, but I think, I mean, it's something that I think, you know, writers in general should think about because it is, you know, it's a valid criticism. I just don't know if it's something where, like, we should go back at every movie that has existed and television show that has existed and start, like, shitting all over those characters. Because here's the thing, talking about Daredevil specifically, when he was first introduced, blind people wrote into Marvel saying how much they loved the character because, you know, it was a blind person who was a superhero. It can be, you know, very inspiring for some people. And I would argue, again, with the instance of Daredevil, and I guess by extension Sherrod Imway, he is still blind. He can't see. He just has... He makes his way through the world using other senses. He has the radar sense that he can means that he can see things like inside his mind, but he is still blind. That's very much the case for him. Yes, it's somewhat nullified, but in many ways it also isn't. So I think it's a, I think it's much more complex than either side who would either you know go all in on that or yeah. who would immediately dismiss it would claim to be. Yeah, and like I'm not gonna I'm not gonna shit all over Toph Beifong. Yeah, you know, that's another like, good example. It's like, you know what I mean? Yeah, so I mean, I get it. Maybe it's something that people should try in the future, but but again, I'm not a disabled person, so... And neither am I. This is why I'm bringing this up, because I, I am, you know, I'm in this instance, I am quite privileged, and uh, whilst, the, whilst I didn't create this character, in fact, actually, apparently, Donnie Yen was the guy who came up with the idea of the character being blind. He was given actually a lot of freedom by uh, the director to, uh, Gareth Edwards, to, to you know, sort out the character himself. And he said, hey, what if he was blind? And I think, I don't know, I think it is kind of cool in this instance because that he uses the force to see. But again, in the original movie, that wasn't really explained very well. And so I want to explain it a bit more here later on. So part of the reason why I'm bringing this up is just to, you know, to, sh to let you know, Capers, that I am aware of the potential complexities regarding this character. We're still going to move forward full steam ahead, but I just wanted to bring that up just so you know that I know that I get it. So Jared Inway kicks all of the Mercs' ass. It's hilarious. And Bulwark sort of, you know, sticks to the back a little bit. He, uh... He's like, okay, let's see how this goes. The Mercs get their asses kicked and only Bulwark is left. He's like, okay, I guess I'll I better try it. And they have a little fight. And Bulwark, to his credit, does put up a very good fight. And he looks like he might have the upper hand at one point, but then suddenly he hesitates when Chirrut says, I am one with the Force and the Force is with me. And Chirrut uses his distraction to beat Bulwark. Now, yes, I'm keeping that line from Rogue One, but I need to make something very, very clear, okay? What was Chirrut in Rogue One? What was his title? What was his job, Jillian? Chirrut is the blind guy, right? <laughs> Chirrut is the blind <laughs> Yes! I don't know names. Wasn't he like, you know, I don't even know. He was like a priest or something, like protecting the old ways of the Jedi. Wasn't he something like that? Kind of. Okay, so as I understand it, and bear in mind, I don't blame you for not really knowing because the movie explains it horribly. But in the movie, Jeddah, the planet where a lot of the action takes place, was the location of a bunch of kyber crystals which were used to power the Death Star's laser, blah, 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 blah. And when the Empire raided the temple and took all the kyber crystals, he was sort of cast out and now preaches about the, uh, the Force on the street, which you think would get him arrested, but I don't know. But here's the thing. He wasn't a Jedi. And I thought initially, and a lot of people thought, that he was a Jedi or an ex-Jedi or something like that. However, he wasn't. What he was was a Guardian of the Quills. Now, Gillian, I know the answer to this, but just to torture you just a little bit, what are the wills? I don't fucking know. <laughs> Neither do I, because... Uh, no, oh god, the, the fucking wills. So the wills, or the wills, are the are holdover from the earliest, earliest, like, twinkling in George Lucas's eye 
drafts of Star Wars. The idea was that there was this, these beings called the Whills that live off the Force and exist in kind of like a microscopic universe, but are also observing the story, like the saga of Star Wars, take place. And they're like the narrator of the whole entire story. And they eventually got dropped and turned into something else. Then that got dropped and turned into something else. Then they got turned into like a backup, like small children's novel that George Lucas was going to use to further Star Wars if the first movie flopped. But that didn't happen, so that got discarded. And George Lucas apparently had a plan to use the wills in his version of the sequel trilogy, and that never happened. The wills are basically just an idea, a concept that just got abandoned and re-abandoned at various stages of development since the fucking 70s. So no one really knows, except perhaps George Lucas, what the fuck the wills are. And yet they casually drop in Rogue One, oh, that guy, yeah, he's a guardian of the Whills. Right. I have decided to make the logical and sane choice to completely fucking drop that. Yeah, yeah, you know, makes sense. He's not a guardian of the Whills. He's, yeah, as we saw in the opening flashback, he's just a failed Jedi. Simple, we understand it, and it allows us to, you know explore the character in a more streamlined but also interesting way but we're still gonna have him say i'm one of the force and the force is with me okay which still gonna has that and as i said before a uh, bulwark gets uh, distracted by that and chirrut uses it to kick his ass the mercs completely humiliated retreat to their ship and bulwark looks back at chirrut who's just slowly walking away full of conflict he's just like oh who is this guy? God. They fly back into space and the Hoss contacts their Imperial handler, telling them, like, okay, you said this is going to be an easy job shaking down a bunch of illiterate peasants, but now we got our ass kicked by this weird guy talking about the Force. And the officers are like, oh, the Force? Huh. Okay, here's what you're going to do. You're going to wait in orbit, you're going to stay there, do not move an inch, and you're going to wait for reinforcements. Back down on the planet, Chirrut continues to meditate, repeating his mantra, I am one of the Force and the Force with me, yada yada yada. And then we flash back, while he's meditating, to his arrival at a Jedi Enclave on Phallax. He's moody, he's vulnerable, he's just wrapped up in self-pity... And he lashes out at anyone who tries to talk to him and just completely retreats inwards. We see him at his most miserable. But it's only a very quick flashback. And then we go back to the present where the Mercs are joined by another ship in orbit uh, piloted by an Imperial Inquisitor. How much do you know about the Imperial Inquisitors? Um, if you explained it to me, I probably remember about it, but, like, if you just say to me, like, what are Imperial Inquisitors, I'm not gonna know, because I don't know names or te or terminology. Fair enough. Okay, so, if you watched, uh, Star Wars Rebels, or played Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order, you will have seen the Inquisitors. They're basically ex-Jedi that got captured by the Empire, uh, brainwashed, tortured, indoctrinated, and basically sent out to find and capture slash kill more Jedi and, you know, continue the will of the Emperor. And as powerful and strong as they are, they all pale in comparison to Darth Vader. And there's a whole bunch of them scattered throughout the Star Wars canon. And there was even some um, in the previous Legends canon, although they didn't go into as much detail back then. But uh, I did my research, and apparently there's one, well, at least one Imperial Inquisitor that did uh, has not been mentioned so far and they all have titles like second sister or tenth brother so this is the third brother and that's all we're going to know about him and so people who are familiar with star wars rebels and jelly fallen order will see this guy and go like eee, it's an inquisitor eee! and that's just like one of the few callbacks i'm gonna make but he's a completely new character and he's intimidating and scary. And he's kind of got like this Darth Vader sort of presence about him. But also, he seems a bit more unstable, a bit more on edge. He's not as cool, calm and collected as Vader was. He feels like 
He's just always on the edge, just on the edge of snapping all the time. Nevertheless, right. He has to be the exact opposite or what the uh, blind Jedi could have been. Exactly. This is a story about, you know, like I said, uh, seeing how how bad things could have gone. And there's, there's, um, there's a lot of duality and juxtaposition between different characters. And the mercs are incredulous that the reinforcements are just one guy. They're just like, this guy, really? Is this guy gonna, you know, be our backup? You're just one guy. The Inquisitor responds by kicking their asses again. But just when you think, oh, they're going to be humiliated again, he says, I trust I have made my lesson clear. No? Well then. And he kills one of the mercenaries. Easily. The mercs are now duly pacified and scared and follow him down to the planet. Once they land, Chirrut sends a disturbance in the force ooh, and goes out to greet the ship as it lands. The third brother, Bulwark, and the mercs all disembark and the third brother asks Chirrut if he is a Jedi. And all Chirrut says is, I am one with the force and the force is with me. The Inquisitor does not like this answer and immediately begins to duel Chirrut. Here's the thing though, Chirrut, no lightsaber, just that big stick. And the Inquisitor, very much pro lightsaber. And this will be a chance for us to have in live action the Inquisitor's lightsabers. Uh, if you will have you know, watched those uh, shows I mentioned and played that video game, you'll know that the Inquisitors have dual bladed lightsabers that spin on an axis. Nice. Very nice, unless they use them as fucking helicopter blades. Then they're stupid. Take note, Star Wars Rebels. You made something really cool, really stupid. How could you? So, they're fighting, despite the fact that Chirrut is a distinct disadvantage, but he's constantly ducking, diving, and dodging. Dodge, dive, dip, duck, and dodge. You know? And this is really, really annoying the Inquisitor. Hoss, meanwhile, reminds the mercs of their orders given to them by Inquisitor, and they start completely annihilating the settlement, just blasting things and people left, right, and centre. Bulwark is doing so reluctantly, but we notice he's only targeting, like, buildings and ships and stuff, not people. Chirrut tries to stop them, but he's a bit too busy trying to deal with a third brother. And Bulwark suddenly finds himself surrounded by violence and laser blasts and people screaming out in terror. And he has a PTSD flashback. Now, I wasn't a fan of all the flashbacks they did in Rise of Skywalker and the other um, uh, sequel movies, because it didn't feel very in keeping with the Star Wars uh, Skywalker saga. Because right. even in the even in the prequels, they didn't really do that sort of thing. But these, this isn't the Skywalker saga. So you have greater flexibility in terms of how you tell your story. So we get a flashback now, a PTSD-laced flashback to the Clone Wars. It's less, uh, you know, clear and less, uh, you know, full of clarity as the previous flashbacks we've got with Chirrut Inwe. Now it's more, like, disjointed and hazy and, you know, shaky cam. Ooh. And we flashback to a massive battle, a siege, on the planet Ariadu, which... Fun fact is the homeworld of Moff Tarkin. Nice. You don't care at all, do you? No, po probably because I don't remember who that guy is. Like, I need to see a picture of him. I don't remember names. I don't know how many times I need to say this. <laughs> Peter Cushing's character in the first Star Wars movie. Again, you used a name. That, it's the, I, I don't... Finn... Bone what? How do you guy. spell? How do you spell his name? Peter Cushing or Tarkin? Oh, Tarkin. Okay, I remember him. Got it. Ah, you don't do it. Anyway, that was meant to be just like a fun little aside, and you ruined it, Jillian. I'm sorry. You know, I really don't know names. I don't know how. <laughs> like, fair enough. You know what I feel like? I feel like. A priest at Sunday school teaching kids about like Abraham and Isaac and Moses and just yeah, getting a who, blank stare back at me. Yeah, who who the you know? I know Moses, but everybody else, you know, those other names, I don't know who they are. 
I even remember some of those names and I'm an atheist. God. Uh, that's just how my brain works. Anyway, uh, on Araidu, he ends up separating from his squad when they're all killed and he himself is overwhelmed by droids. But then we suddenly break back to the present and he just kind of has a little PTSD breakdown, just slump into the ground, just like completely overwhelmed. But then he sees Chirrut being knocked unconscious and about to be killed by the third brother. And something in him just snaps. He charges at the third brother, knocks him down. He picks up Chirrut, slings him over his shoulder and runs for the Merc ship while the settlement burns behind them. The ship takes off, the third brother recovers, and has the mercs gather all the remaining still-alive settlers together. He asks them questions about Chirrut. Who is he? Where does he come from? Do we know where he's going? And when he's gotten answers, or lack thereof, he kills them all. Well, he doesn't yeah, just... as you do. As you do, but he doesn't give it to the, like, the, the mercs. He did, we don't, we're not going to do an opening to the Force Awakens here. Nope, the brother is going to kill these defenseless men and women by himself. Yeah. So Chirrut wakes up aboard the Merc ship and questions Borok. Like, hey, what's going on here? Borok explains that he didn't know why, but he just couldn't let the third brother kill him. Chirrut points out, well, you let the settlement die. But Borok claims, you know, I couldn't do anything about that. If you want, I could drop you back at the settlement. And Chirrut's like... No, it's better this way. And they both agree that now they have to go on the run from the Empire. Bulwark asks if there's anywhere Chirrut would like to go. Chirrut says he's been travelling for a little while now, and that he travels as the Force wills. Bulwark sort of prompts him like, Okay, can you be more specific? And Chirrut just, just doesn't answer. He gets quite annoyed at this, and so he's like, Okay, you know what, screw it, we're going to Taris. Now, um, you won't know what Taris is, I'm guessing. Uh, is it featured in the Clone Wars? I think it might be, maybe not. No, it's mainly featured in a very famous video game, Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic, which then you I, will I, have heard of. Yeah, no, I've heard of the game, but I haven't played it. You so should, it's so good. But the opening to the game takes place on Taris, and it's kind of, it's a city... Like, so, um, in previous episodes, I mentioned the planet Nar Shaddaa, and of course, you'll have heard of Coruscant. If Coruscant is like a sparkling, gleaming city planet, and Nar Shaddaa is like a really filthy, disgusting city planet, Taris is somewhere in between. Like, it's quite nice in some parts, but the rest of it is just a shithole. But it's also in the Outer Rim, so that's the nearest place to go. And again, that's just a, one of the few callbacks we're going to be making. And... So they travel to Taris, and as they're going to hyperspace, Chirrut inquires about, you know, So, you're a clone, aren't you? Bulwark has an answer. You're a clone. So why would you help me? What? Why, why wouldn't I help you? You think I'm a Jedi, don't you? Maybe. Then why would you help me? Why wouldn't I help you? Well, you killed all of us, didn't you? All the Jedi. Bork's like, no, 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 we didn't. Yeah, yeah, you did. And eventually, Boa just refuses to answer any more questions. He doesn't get why Chirrut is pursuing this line of inquiry, because he's not acting in a very accusatory manner, or even in a sad manner, or in a happy manner. He's just been kind of neutral and mysterious. And it's very confusing for him. They land on Taris later on, and Bulwark suggests, okay, you know what, this has been fun, but I think we've got to part ways, I need to find, you know, new Merc outfit to hook up with. And Chirrut's like, nah, I think I'll travel with you for a while. Well, I don't really want you to. Well, you don't really get a choice. The Force has intertwined our destinies. We have to walk the same path now. And Bulwark's like, yeah, how about no? And just completely walks away. Turns a corner. And who's standing there before him? It's Chirrut. And this is where we get a little bit of like a lighthearted moment. Bulwark keeps trying to get away from Chirrut, but Chirrut just keeps on mysteriously just catching up to him, turning up in front of him behind every single corner. And Bulwark eventually just 
gives up and they just say, okay, let's go into that bar and have a chat. And they go into a cantina and again, have a little nice little talk. And one of the things I wanted to have in this uh, movie was a lot of action scenes, a lot of chance to show off like the cool martial arts and gunplay and stuff. But there's also going to be a lot of conversations. There's a lot of time in this movie for the characters to sit down and let moments seek in. And at this point, uh, Jared's uh, is asked by Bulwark how he can see if he's blind. I mean, you're clearly blind. How can you see? And Jared's just like, I can't see. Again, doesn't go into any more detail. Really annoying Bulwark. And <laughs> Jared then says, okay, okay, I'll, I'll go easy on you. And, I'll, and he reveals, again, via flashback, that on Phallix, he was approached by uh, this creature, this animal creature native to the planet called a Seldra. And at first he just ignored it because he's like so wrapped up in misery. But eventually he slowly sensed a dim connection to the force via the creature. I mean, it's just an animal, but he still senses the force within it. And eventually he follows the, this particular Seldra out of the Jedi Enclave through the wilds of the planet Phallix, learning to navigate despite being blind. He finds himself surrounded by life in all its myriad forms and he senses the force within all that life so you remember that scene like one of the few good scenes in the last jedi where luke is teaching ray about the force and you know how she feels the force throughout the whole island yeah yeah it's a very similar scene to that and but it's narrated by Chirrut talking about how he learned through the seldra to sense the world around him through the Force. He can't see, but he can feel everything. He's very much blind, but the Force is everywhere, meaning he can sense everything. However, it does take all of his concentration to do so. His connection to the Force is still damaged, even to this day. Uh, so he can't do, like, you know, Jedi mind tricks or, you know, levitation or any of that stuff. But he can sense the world around him and he often wondered why the Seltra reached out to him in such a way and it wasn't until later that he realized that the Seldra were blind too and so what do you what do you make of that in terms of the whole uh, ableist not ableist discussion I mean it's 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 basically Toph's origin story so I'm okay with that oh shit it is <laughs> I slightly forgot about that. Okay, I, 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 the way I have it in my head, it's portrayed a little bit differently. It's again, it's sensing the force, which is a bit different from earth bending, but yeah, similar sort of stuff, I guess. We we'll pretend like that doesn't happen. It's a, you know what? This is why you have multiple drafts, people. This is why. And after he's done with that, Bulwark then uh, realizes, oh shit, I've got to offer up something on myself as well. And he reveals that after the Clone Wars, he fell in with the Merc group after the clones got phased out in favor of constrict conscripted stormtroopers, which is still, for me, is a bit of a plot hole in the Star Wars canon, but we won't go into that. And he doesn't really want to go into any more detail. And he basically just ends up with asking Chirrut, Okay, so why would you trust me? Like, you say you're not a Jedi, okay, fine, but why would anyone trust us? Part of the reason we were phased out is because, you know, we killed the Jedi. No one really trusted us anymore. Why would you trust me knowing about Order 66? And Chirrut just replies, I am one with the Force, and the Force is with me. Bulk's like, yeah, okay, but what does that mean? And while they're talking about that, an Imperial spy overhears the conversation and sends a report directly to the third brother. Uh, don't ask me why. Plot convenience. I'm allowed. Shut up. And third brother is now on his ship, taking the Merc band with him. And it's like, okay, well done. Guess what, guys? We're going to Taris, and we're going to kill those two bastards. And one of the Mercs uh, speaks up and says, okay, look, I get, like, the blind guy, but do we really have to kill a Bulwark? Like, we fought with him. He's good people. <laughs> Immediately killed. <laughs> it's like, anyone else have any objections? No? That's great. Uh, Bulwark, after uh, the conversation, notices the Imperial spy 
and kills him after he's already too late to stop him from warning for her brother. And basically says to Chirrut, okay, you know what, Taris is no longer safe, we need to find a new place to go. Is there anywhere, seriously, that you think we could go? And don't just say, like, go where the Force wills us. And Chirrut says he heard rumours of a long-hidden Jedi temple uh, on the mountains of a planet called Yuvalum, which is another planet that I've just made up. You don't need to have heard about it. They... I mean, I probably wouldn't have recon- I didn't recognize the name, and I wouldn't have even if it existed already, so it doesn't matter. Fair enough. Oh, uh, God. So, uh, they, um, they get back on their ship, and, uh, about to and leave the planet, but while they're in orbit, they're intercepted by the Inquisitor's ship. Actually, you know what? You know, I wrote it down as they get intercepted in orbit, but I'm going to change that. Now, instead, I'm going to have the Inquisitor's ship meet them in the airspace of the planet. So now we're going to get a dogfight between the two ships, weaving through the big buildings and of the uh, planet city of Taris. Which, which may sound slightly similar to the big chase we got in episode two between like Obum Kenobi and Anakin and uh, Zam Wazel, the shape changer. But um, fuck you, I want my cool spaceship chase. Yeah, no, spaceship chases are fine. Yeah. And a bit of a dogfight, wreck a couple of buildings, exchange fire. Uh, the Merc ship that um, Chirrut and Bulwark are on gets a lot of damage, but they do manage to get into orbit and hyperspace away. But not before the third brother uses a strange device he has that establishes a connection of some kind. And when it beeps positive, like a step connection established, the Inquisitor is very happy about that for some reason. And because there's too much damage to the ship, they ended up dropping out of hyperspace, and they are at Uvalum, but they crash land in the mountains. And they trek over the mountain range to find the temple, and it's sort of modelled after, you know, those Nepalese uh, Buddhist monasteries that you find, but it's, it's, it's in a lot of disrepair. It's basically one step away from being completely ruined. And Chirrut is visibly sad by this. But was like, why? You can't see it. He's like, no, but I can feel it. I can feel the pain that's here. That's still here, what? And suddenly, they're approached by a hooded figure. It's like, welcome to my Jedi temple. And it's revealed to be... <gasps> Adra Yadan from the beginning. You know, the person that... Uh... I, I, yeah, no, I, this one I got. Okay. I'm, I'm good here. Okay. And she, and then she like welcomes them. It's like, hey, cheer it. Been a long time. How you been? Uh, he's like, uh, been blind. How have you been? Oh, I'll tell you what I've been doing. I've been rebuilding the Jedi Order. Seriously? Oh, yes. You see, you got to escape the cataclysm of Order 66, Chirrut. You got lucky because, you know, because, you know, you've just been wandering the galaxy as an ex-Jedi. However, the rest of us, we've had to live in hiding, but no longer, because I'm going to use this secrecy to rebuild the Jedi Order and we'll strike back against the Empire. And they spend some time in the ruins talking with Adra and getting to see what she's been up to. And Bulwark's a little skeptical, like, yeah, this doesn't seem fantastic. And then they meet her Jedi acolytes. And it turns out they're uh, they're not in the best shape. They're kind of half starved. They can barely fight or even use the Force. And they just seem not, not so much mindless, but just clinging to something that no longer really exists. And Chirrut himself senses that Adra is just... A little bit unbalanced. She's not really quite right in the head. And it's just like, Adra, this isn't really going to work. She's like, yeah, well, we'll crush Vader and all those other Imperial bastards. We just need more people. And now that you're here, maybe you can help. And she was just like, Adra, there are ways we could fight against the Empire, but we can't do that this way. You need to let go of the past. See my eyes? See, see what happened to me? I was so wrapped up in my misery for so long, but it was only by letting go and accepting what I'd become 
and my change in circumstance that I was finally able to move forward. And she's like, no, 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 no. See, the Jedi need to come back. And, and Joe's like, and they will, if it's the will of the Force. And she's like, you don't really get what we're doing here, Chirrut. And then they start fighting. And she distracts Bulwark by sicking her indoctrinated acolytes on him. And they're not really so much of a threat, but he doesn't want to hurt them. So he's just struggling to stop them without severely injuring them. Meanwhile, Chirrut and Adra are fighting once again. He's pleading with her to see reason, but she doesn't listen. So wrapped up in a pain that she is. And that fight is somewhat interrupted by the arrival of the mercenary band. Who, as soon as they arrive, kill all the acolytes, much to Adra's intense pain. The third brother arrives and reveals that he found them by tracing the control chip inside Bulwark's head. Now, um, have we talked about this, the whole control chip thing, you and me, Jillian? Um, I don't think we have, but I know what it is, so, you know, yeah, it's the, I'm actually it's, good on this. Yeah, it's the, the cables that don't know, it's the new reason why Order 66 happened. It wasn't just, like, part of the uh, clones' training. It was a control chip that was put in the heads to sort of, like, take over their minds and kill all their, like, Jedi allies. And apparently they can be tracked because Borwak never got his taken out. And... Uh, what was, how do I want to phrase this? Um, and well, that, that's that's how they got there. And the third brother starts sort of taunting both of them, just like, how interesting. The failed Jedi and the ex-clone. I mean, have you told Jirrut here about all the things you did? And Jirrut's like, I already know, Order 66, it happened. I've moved past it. Oh, really? Because I've been looking up at some of the records. Some of the uh, Imperial records on the Jedi during the last days of Clone Wars. Bulwark, you didn't happen to tell Chirrut here exactly what you did. And Bulwark is forced to reveal to Chirrut that uh, during the Clone Wars on Ar- Ariadu, like we saw in that flashback previously, he was nearly killed by droids, only to be saved by a Jedi. Kratos Null, the master from the beginning of the story. <gasps> that callback! And then, it was just like, oh, thanks so much, Master Jedi. And Kratos like, no worries, now let's beat back these droids. Absolutely! Oh, wait a second, I'm getting a call. Excuse me? Execute Order 66. Bulwark immediately guns down the Jedi, completely horrified by what he's done as soon as he's done it. And we flash back to the present... And he's like, yeah, I killed a Jedi that immediately saved me. It, to be perfectly honest, Jillian, I'm not entirely happy with the way I wrote this. It's, I feel like there's a greater level of either surprise or emotion that I could really reach for. So how would you handle that? Off the top of your head. Maybe... Maybe not just killing that one Jedi, but, like, several, I guess, including the one that he knew? I don't know. It's kind of hard with something that, like, yeah, they all died, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and then everybody died. The end. It's it, it's kind of hard to do that, especially when Jared already knows it. I wasn't sure whether to, you know, have them not know about Order 66 or do know. But it's... I mean, it's, it's what I went with, you know? You can disagree, capers. And so, uh, but Chirrut, surprisingly, forgives him. He's just like, okay, it's all right. I, well, It's not all right, but I forgive you. Adra, however, does not forgive him. She is very angry that her former master was killed by Bulwark and lashes out of rage only to be easily killed by the Inquisitor. And at the last moment, he says... You know, you look a little bit too broken to be an Inquisitor. And just, like, disposes of her really casually. God, it's awful. And then, in his last moments, like, well, I've had fun, but I think it's time for someone else to do some of the heavy lifting around here. And he takes out that strange device he had earlier and activates it. 
which engages Bulwark's control chip. And he tells Bulwark, Execute Order 66. Bulwark immediately starts fighting Churret. Twist! But couldn't sure it like do an argument where like I'm not a Jedi, so like Well and then you bring that up, but then I'm gonna talk about that a little bit later. Oh, Before okay. that happens. Uh <laughs> <laughs> uh Bulwark and them and sure it start fighting. You know, big epic last emotional uh, climax. Um Chirrut pleading with him to regain control, Bulwark just not listening. The Merc Band, meanwhile, just argue with Hoss saying, like, dude, this has gone on far enough. This is more than what we signed up for. We should either help Bulwark or better yet, get the hell out of here. Hoss, meanwhile, throughout this whole movie, has been slowly but surely been just completely broken and reduced to a shell of his former self. Like at the beginning, we see him being all cocky and arrogant. But now, he's basically a husk due to being continually abused and tormented by the Inquisitor. And he's just like... Nope, no, we need to do what he says. We need to do what he says. It's like, or we could just go. He's like, uh, uh, and then he just kills the rest of the mercs just out of sheer terror. Uh, Chirrut and Bulwark continue to fight through the temple with a third brother just hanging in the background, just like goading them on. Chirrut tells Bulwark he has to, you know, forgive himself. He has to move past it. And Bulwark, in a brief moment of lucidity, just says he doesn't know how. Right before the control chip re-engages. At this point, Chirrut just tells him to trust in the Force. And... In a new sort of format, I want to experiment with here on a re-script. Uh, Jillian, you get to choose how this ends. What? Yes. You have... Two options for how you want this story to end. I've written two completely different endings based on this ending. I'm going all telltale on your ass. Oh, that's good, because I actually uh, am currently playing The Walking Dead telltale, so you know. So you're in the right mindset. Okay. Yeah. Chirrut has two options. Option A, remind him, as you said earlier, that he's not a Jedi. Or option number two... Allow Obi Wan Kenobi style Bulwark to kill him. I That's mean, all I'm gonna tell you. I mean, if I was the smart, I mean, like, oh, man, because it's like one of those things where it's like the the sneaky person in me wants just to be like, "Yo, I'm not a Jedi," but I feel like this might be one of those telltale situations that you're throwing on me, where if I say that then that's not going to give me the ending that I want. I love playing mind games like this. I really do. It speaks to the seventh doctor in me. <laughs> I, I think it's in the wine glass in front of me. <laughs> <laughs> um, eh, you know what? Just for shits and giggles, he's going to say he's not a Jedi. <laughs> okay, and... Bear in mind, Capers, I am never going to reveal what the other ending entailed. Not going to do it. Oh, so God live damn it. <laughs> No, no, you made your choice, so now we're sticking with it. He reminds him that he's not a Jedi. Technically, I was never a Jedi. And Bulwark stops fighting. It's like, oh. And Control Chip deactivates. And they both slowly turn on the third brother. He looks down at the vice, looks up at him. He's like, oh. Shit. Did I say the previous climactic uh, duel was the last climactic duel? I lied. This is the big climactic duel. Both of them, you know, uh, Bulwark, I should point out this point, Bulwark this whole time has the same equipment as uh, Baze Malbus in the original Rogue One movie. He's got the big heavy repeating uh, tank gun and he's fighting um, the Inquisitor with that, defecting blaster bolts with his lightsaber, all while Chirrut, you know, does his sneaky... Did dodge diff da da blah, blah and the Inquisitor starts to get, become overwhelmed. He turns and looks to Hoss, and Hoss is just like, "Uh, gotta go!" and runs away in panic. Chirrut and Bulwark advance and defeat the third brother, eventually sending him over the edge of a cliff. Bear in mind again, they're still in the mountains on this big uh, Jedi temple, and they're just like, "Ah, ah," and and. 
and they call him Baze Malvis, Bulwark, says, um, you know, that wasn't really trusting in the Force. That was just a sneaky tactic. And Joe's just like, yeah, sometimes the Force means being sneaky. They catch up to Hoss and just, when he's about to board his ship and they throw him off the ship. And they take the ship and leave him in the ruins. And he's just like, what the hell? What am I meant to do now? And he's just like, eh, you'll figure it out. You're smart. Maybe you should trust in the Force. And then they just leave him there. Don't feel bad for him. He was a horrible person. I mean, I don't. <laughs> so Chirrut asks, in a you know, a bit of a role reversal from earlier, Chirrut asks Bulwark where they should go now. And Bulwark says, hey, maybe we should trust in the Force. And they hyperspace away to parts unknown. And that's the movie. Now, one thing I haven't mentioned about this movie is the title. This is a brand new movie. So based on this story, based on the tone and the elements that I brought up, off the top of your head, uh, what would you call this movie? Oh, I don't know. I was actually just currently thinking that I feel like your telltale little scheme would have just gotten me the same ending no matter what I chose. <laughs> that, that's what I was starting to think. Slightly different dialogue. <laughs> I am making no comment. You're never going to know one way or the other. I mean, I don't need to. Your silence says everything. Or does it? Or does it? Because I'm looking at my notes right here. I know you don't know. But anyway. um, So, I mean, the, the, the placeholder name I came up with my notes was called Journey of the Force. It's a bit generic. A little bit, uh... Yeah, I'm never good with titles, I'm not gonna lie. Me neither, to be perfectly honest. I've never been fantastic with them. Uh, it, so, I, I I don't know, that's something that we would leave to the marketers. Although, I want to point out something I didn't realise until it was pointed out to me recently. All of the sequel titles all start with the word THE. The Force Awakens, The Last Jedi, The Rise of Skywalker. I think we can do better than that. Yeah. Just saying. And so that's the movie. I think that's a much better, much more fitting story for these two characters to be in. Yeah, they've gone through some changes, mainly uh, Bulwark, but it's something that feels a little bit different. It's standalone, but has a few callbacks. It has interesting ideas, explores the nature of the Force, the nature of PTSD from war, the nature of accepting and forgiving oneself, and... In more, the more subtle, quieter moments, which we can't really go into great detail because it's not that very interesting to listen to, it would go into, uh, you know, much more spiritual and philosophical elements. Something that has been alluded to in previous Star Wars movies, but hasn't been given um, maybe a ton of focus on, perhaps most of all in uh, The Empire Strikes Back, which is part of the reason, actually, to be honest, why that Star Wars movie is my favourite Star Wars movie, because of all the scenes... Uh, with Yoda and Luke on Dagobah, as well as all the cool action scenes and stuff going on with Han and Leia. And that's also kind of why I like those scenes in uh, The Last Jedi between um, Luke and Rey, just talking about the Force and exploring these spiritual ideas. I I, I just kind of like that stuff. That has a lot of appeal for me. Yeah, I actually did kind of, like, I don't know how you would justify this, but I did think of a slightly better, like, twist with him killing that jedi dude okay let's hear it he kills him but not because of order 66 he does it for another reason like it's happening around the same time as order 66 but the fact that he had his chip in him is not the reason why he kills him how he does that it is better i did how he does it or why i have no fucking idea but he does it not because of Order 66. Because the whole thing is that the guy thinks that he did it because of Order 66. But it turns out he didn't do it because of that. Now that's actually really interesting. Because with Order 66, he loses all autonomy. He's ho- scarred by it, horrified by it. But it, he wasn't really in any control. So the um, the tragedy of the situation is lessened somewhat. And we could convince the audience that he killed this Jedi because of Order 66. But then it's revealed later on, as you say... Uh, that it was happened maybe right before Order 66. And then you got the whole Order 66 kill all Jedi message. And it's like, too late, I already did that. And that's why he has to forgive himself. That's very interesting. 
Yep. Should have thought of that myself. Damn it. Okay, so let's pretend that this is why I talk this over with you, Gillian. This is why I have you here so that we can get, you know, more than just one person's idea. Because because that's how you should make Star Wars movies. Like, I'm not going to pretend like there's a perfect formula for Star Wars movies, but the closest we can get to it is George Lucas comes up with a bunch of ideas, get a talented, visionary, but still, you know, work-a-day director on, and they collaborate and come up together. Director's in charge of the movie, but he gets a lot of his ideas from George, but also has veto power. And it's more than just one person in the room coming up with ideas. Solitary. But likewise, it's not a bunch of corporate execs in a room coming up with, like, a list of buzzwords, including diversity and dinosaurs. Yep. That's all you need to do. Give Lord Miller some autonomy. Get George Lucas on board because he is very good at coming up with ideas until he suddenly isn't. Which is why you just say, no, George, that that's stupid. And why would he even talk like that? Misa, you, sir, that's stupid. Stop it. So I, th- I think that's how we do it. And on top of that, create standalone stories that don't have any great connection to the rest of the uh, universe, but have interesting self-contained stories. I think that's honestly how it could work. Um, and of course, we would have uh, Tamara Morrison and Donnie Yen, who I think would work like Tamara Morrison. I'll be honest, I'm not a big fan of him as an actor. He's not fantastic. But actually, you know what? When you look back at the Clone Wars and Aquaman and, yes, more recent episodes of The Mandalorian, he, when he plays a certain kind of character, the sort of gruff and gritty character with like a little bit of a sarcastic edge to him, he can make a somewhat compelling performance, and I think if I got a, we got a director that really pushed that sort that sort of aspect of him, we could get a very good performance out of him. And Donnie Yen, I already know, is a good actor, so you know, easily done. Right. Which begs the question: Who would you get to direct this movie? Oh, I don't know. I don't know either, because like whenever someone asks me, "Ooh, who do you think should have directed that movie?" My first answer is always Taika Waititi, and I love Taika Waititi. He can't direct everything; he's a busy man, you know. Yeah. And so my first thought would be someone who has experience directing martial arts movies, not Ang Lee. I mean, yeah. very clear, not Ang Lee. He only meant to do it once and never again. So, so who who else is the question? I don't personally know, but I, I think I mean, they... there's always also the option of getting a relatively new director, like yeah. that we don't even know. Yeah, some of the greatest and... some of the greatest like movies have come from like it was like their a director that's now well known. It was one of their first movies, so. Absolutely, there's no reason why we can't do that. Someone who's a real passion for those kinds of movies, but and also again the more spiritual, philosophical movies. Um, actually, saying all that out loud, um, it's probably a really stupid idea. But what about the guys who uh, whose names I continually forget? The guys who did Avatar: The Last Airbender brought them up a few times. That could work. Wait, you mean the creators of Avatar The Last Airbender? Yeah. Mike and Brian? Yeah. I don't know if they would know, like, how to direct a live action, though. Mm, yeah, that, that, that's the only, that's the only thing, hold back for me. I mean, that's not the only hold back. I'm just spitballing ideas at this point. Like, I'm, I purely focus on the script aspect and the story aspect. I leave, you know, behind the director to someone else, but... You got to be a bit canny. I'm just, I'm just saying, you can't get Ron Howard into it. And no. that's not to say I, I don't like Ron Howard. I do like Ron Howard. He's just the wrong kind of guy, and it's, it's tricky. It's tricky. Ron Howard could do a great Marvel movie, not a good Star Wars movie. You know, it's it's that kind of mentality we need to have. And but who knows? Thanks to Dave Filoni and John Favreau heaping up all the accolades. Maybe that's the direction Star Wars will go in from now on. I don't know. And that's the great thing about Star Wars is it has gone through all these peaks and valleys. It's had its high points. It's had its low points. But it always keeps on going. And maybe one day we will get a movie like this. Probably not with uh, Chirrut Imwe and uh, Baze Melbus or Bulwark or whatever. 
But this is just I, I this this is how I would imagine that story featuring them. You know, it's but a it's but a wish on a dream on a fucking daydream brought along by eating too many magic mushrooms. I don't know. Just an idea. I enjoy it. Hopefully you guys will too. Is there anything else you'd like to add, Gillian? No, nothing else. Okay, well in that case, I think we're going to end it there. Thank you very much, Gillian, for joining me today. Yeah, of course. And... (coughs) (coughs) Sorry, I got something caught in my throat. Try that again. Uh, Thank you very much, Gillian, Gillian, for joining me today. Of course. And, uh, Capers, if you if you enjoy the show, please tell your friends, Shanna from the Rooftops. And if you haven't already, go back and listen to some of our other super episodes, uh, like our previous rescripts, we'll talk about Road One and all that crap. Although, uh, heads up, Capers, I'm not gonna do a rescript of the final uh, sequel movie, Rise of Skywalker. For many reasons. Partly, uh, I've run out of ideas. Partly, I just don't care anymore. Partly, I'm just so angry! And partly because so many other people have come up with their own unique ideas, including George Lucas at this point. I'm just not going to bother. I'm sure none of you will lose any sleep. And you can listen to the show on iTunes, Podbean, YouTube, Spotify, Amazon Music, or podcapers.com. If you want to get in touch with us, suggest show topics, or maybe come on the show yourself, you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at AP2HYC. Thank you very much to Dan Harris for our logo, a lovely microphone, the red and blue 3D glasses, those are mine. And thank you for listening. This has been Podcapers, the official podcast for a place to hang your cape. Cue the music!